Okay, today is the final day of the sexual insanity class. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about solutions. And if truth be told, I should be able to finish up this discussion in um, five minutes. Because if we're using our African minds, um, there's a logic that we have to understand. If we have studied Europeans, as Arthur Schomburg instructed us to, and if we have studied ourselves and our traditions, first and foremost, we know that, that those two things are incompatible. We know that we're, the way we are and the way Europeans are are not compatible. The European way and the African way are not compatible. They're uh, irreconcilable, irreconcilably different. So, um, as I said in a previous class, if um, Europeans can not allow Africans to be in their reality, and this is their reality, if they cannot allow Africans to be African in this reality, in fact, they can't allow anyone to be anything other than what they define them to be in this reality, and secondly, if we can't be African in their reality, that doesn't mean that some of us are not in our um, smaller spaces, in our institutions, that we're not practicing what it means to be African. And by practicing, I don't mean playing it, I mean actually doing it. But to, to be African, really, you have to have a, a people because it's not... Um, something that a family or a community can effectively do by themselves. This is, this is a nation function. This is, this is a function of being sovereign. So if we can't be African within European space, it really only leaves two alternatives um, or two choices for us. One of them is for us to be able to isolate ourselves in such a way that Europeans cannot interfere with what they're doing and they respect the threat of what we can do to them to such a degree that they'll leave us alone. And that obviously is not the case um, at the time. And when I say that we have to have a space where we can do what we want to and they feel the threat, that also has to be understood in the context that, that they don't see any space as not being theirs. They don't see any area, anything that they don't feel that they have every right and in fact have that manifest destiny to invade, to corrupt, to contaminate. Um, so we can either isolate ourselves from them, which of course to me is perfectly fine, we can isolate ourselves from them, but that requires that we keep them away. We have a lot of people who want to talk about isolating ourselves from them, even within the European, within a European nation, but these individuals still don't have the military institution in place. So you're dealing with a people who invade anybody, anywhere, for whatever reason possible, whenever they feel like it, and yet they're going to allow you to have this space within their space to do whatever it is that you want to do without you being able to militarily repel them and to spank them in such a way that they know never to try that again. When you're talking about um, solutions to problems, we're talking about being under siege for 2,000 years. We're talking about trying to um, attain... Um, independence, uh, liberation, empowerment, sovereignty. We're not talking about uh, us uh, just getting a little more leeway or us tolerating what's going on and just crying about it until we've gotten so far involved that we become so involved in their society, in their culture, that we don't recognize ourselves anymore. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being African. We're talking about remaining who we are. And the only way that you can do that when you have uh, another nation or other nations of people who see you as fuel, who see you as food, who see you as a toy, is that you either have to stop them in, in one of multiple ways. There's got to be a way of stopping them. There, there, there can't be a discussion. Every time a discussion has occurred between us and other people, uh, we have always come to the discussion table, at least uh, since the time of invasion forward. We've always come to the to the to the um, table from a position of relative powerlessness. Hmm. We might not have recognized it as such, but the conversation, the, the peace talks, the whatever were, they were in place long enough for them to figure out how to go ahead and destroy us. Okay, so it was, it was never a matter of them thinking that um, 
we're going to respect these people. We're going to leave them alone in their space. We may trade with them, what have you, but they're sovereign and we're sovereign. I mean, um, the, the, the record shows just in terms of the indigenous people of this land, there was never a peace treaty that Europeans didn't break. No, all of them were broken. So the history, when you understand the history, the, the, the history tells you how to deal with what have you. If you understand a person, then you know how to deal with that person. If you just met this person, you really don't know how to deal with that person because you don't know their history. They can tell you anything. But when you've, been, when you've seen this person over and over and over again say the same thing over and over again and you recognize that this person is doing nothing but lying, then you know how to deal with that person. Right. And we can't come to any table. Uh, really, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't need to be a table. The, 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 the table time is over. We, 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 we finished that, that discussion. And, of course, I can hear people now saying, oh, well, they have the military might, and they have this, and they have that. It's amazing to me how black folk, African folk, who will say that we are a genius, that we came from all of this, all that, and that nothing is impossible. Anything that you can imagine, you can do. When it comes to the liberation, empowerment, and sovereignty of African people, suddenly, wait a minute, we got to think about this. Wait, we can't do that. Can't come somehow, works its way into the equation. This can't be one of those things that can't work into the equation. It can't be one of those things also that requires uh, instant gratification. It took a long time for us to get into this position. It's going to take a long time for us to get out of this position. But the goal now is to increase the momentum. We're not starting this, okay? but to increase it. In fact, it never really stopped. We just It's our job to increase the momentum, okay? to make sure that our children understand how serious this is, to make sure our children understand this better than we do. So when they get to the helm, they're not, uh, well, should we go over there, or should we go over here, or is this really that important, or you know, it's time to party, or whatever. You know, this is a serious thing. This is a very serious thing. And when it comes to African sexu sexuality, which to me is about as close as you can get to them, uh, this is definitely an area that we can't um, play in. The two key factors, I would argue, that are making this so difficult is fear and ignorance. These are two very critical factors, mostly here, even though there is quite a bit of this, but in general, because sexual behavior is one aspect of a people's being or a person's being. So when you look at all of the aspects, and in every aspect of their life, mental side rules, then there's something bigger at work. And fear is the primary factor here. We are looking to see what their response would be, either consciously or subconsciously, before we, we think, before we act, before we say anything. We're trying to figure out what their response is going to be immediately, before. So we're acting in a way that they would want us to, um, want us to act. However, and this of course is not, not uh, an issue here, and really I would say that this is not an issue here because I know everybody who's here um, in this room, but for a lot of us this is. Um, we are I'm trying not to jump around. We are a family child centered people. This is what we are. That means that our families and our children are supposed to be the first priority in our lives. And that doesn't mean that we um, undermine our own potential as individuals. We don't, we don't give um, so much to the children that there's nothing left for us. That we can't be who we are because we're supposed to be the models for them. So it doesn't mean that we... Um, uh, it's like the, the, the what's the song? Um, something about the children of the future, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yes, that is true. Absolutely that, that is true. But the question is, what kind of future do we have if the children are modeling themselves after parents who are afraid and ignorant? Mm -hmm. So they are our center. <clears throat> the family is our center, but that's not supposed to take from us. That's not supposed to take from the front line. That's supposed to add to the front line. So if we are family and child center, and we know that this is killing us, that this is attacking our children, then this automatically ought to be overridden. This should be the priority. What people will do for their children, 
what I've seen people do for their children, that same thing should apply here when it comes to sexual insanity. And there shouldn't be any area of compromise. Either it's insane or it's not. And there can't be any excuses there. There absolutely can't be any excuses. Who wants that? Successful people, any successful individual. That's baseline. You must act as if it's impossible to fail. You can't see the fear. You have to keep doing whatever it is that you're doing, knowing that it's going to happen. But it says so many times I've heard people say <clears throat> black folks um, lost because they quit right before they succeeded. We have to act as if it's impossible to fail, even if it's an intergenerational thing. We have to act as if it is impossible to fail. And we have to do it with common sense, common African sense. Not just common sense, because not only is sense not all that common, but also if you're thinking out of the European's mind, then you can end up with a common sense that does not assist African people. We're talking about uh, common African sense. We can't see the problem and come up with a solution that flies in the face of reason, that doesn't make any sense. And that's what we're doing in a lot of these cases. To me, the perfect example of that is with our approach to solving the homosexualization of African people, particularly African children. Common sense, and, and I'll approach this as a disease. We'll use the word disease to describe it, even though that's not really what I, I call it. Um, we'll, we'll define it as a disease. And if we use the, the logic of curing diseases, then there's a, a certain approach. When there's an epidemic or there's, there's some kind of plague going on, um, then people respond in a particular fashion. The first thing that they do is that they take the people who are not affected and they isolate them from the infection. That's first and foremost. They don't do anything before they do that. The first thing that they do is they isolate the people from, uh, I guess the most recent example is World War Z, which we went to see, Baba. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was about zombies. Um, but it was interesting, though, some, some, of course, when you go with the right mind, you're looking right. for certain things. The first thing that, that the people did, and the, the, the best example, and it was Israel which of course was amazing to me, just like with the Twin Towers, that's something I knew first. You had, they, they, they created this space, which was already in the work, where they were able to isolate the people who were healthy from the people who were ill. That was the first thing they did. Then they went about the business, okay? Then they went about the business of destroying or taking care of the disease. What do we do? And, and this really came out of discussions that I've had with, with um, folks when, when I've traveled, and these are valid um, inquiries, and they're heartfelt. And people will come and they'll say, "Well, you know, my, my son is homosexualized, or my daughter is homosexualized, or or my best friend is homosexualized, or you know, blah blah. blah. You know, what what can I do about it?" And outside of me, you know, saying you need to talk to uh, Lila Africa, you know, or what have you. Um, my immediate response, especially if it's a question that's not like a personal, it's a question that's asked from the audience is um, we are going about the solution as backward. And it's not that these people are not important. The problem is that we are trying to cure the disease before protecting our children. So while we're focused on these one or two adults, all of these children are being violated. It's sort of like the same logic when, when um, I was asked, well, why, do you, why are you dealing with, with children now when, you, when you're, when you're teaching in the school? Why aren't you dealing with, with adults? Why aren't you dealing with costume? I said because they are the ones who are most likely to be receptive to what's being said. They're the ones that are more open-minded. They're the ones 
who are the best thinkers as far as I'm concerned. So I deal in terms of, of numbers. I'm going to be here, what, 20, 30, 40 years. I need to affect as many people as I can within that time frame. I'm going to be able to influence, if you will, more children than I'm going to be able to influence adults. So logically, I'm going to deal with that. That's the same logical if the children are not infected by it, then you protect them first. Once you have them protected, then you go and you handle the problem. And then the problem kicks in there because we're talking about this as a disease. Most homosexualized Africans don't think that they have a disease. They think that you have a disease because you have an issue with their insanity. So they're not the problem. So you're expending all this energy trying to heal them when they don't want to be healed. If anything, they may want the attention, but they don't want to be healed. It's sort of like white folks who we're trying to spend so much time trying to convince them that they're being racist. Blah, blah. That's, that's the furthest thing from their mind. This is functional for them. This makes perfect sense for them. So for them, you're the one that's crazy. Okay? So we're, we're approaching the solution to this ass backward. And when you do that, you're never going to come out uh, uh, on top. Now... Solutions. Sometimes when we're thinking about solutions, the most important thing to do is to stop and sit down, think about what's wrong, think about what causes it, and what logically would solve it, which is often just the reverse of whatever it is that got it there in the first place. Solutions that we need to think about. Things that allow our children to be easily caught up in the rhetoric of being homosexualized. This extreme individualism that we have adopted, Jerry Clark said, following people who don't know where they're going. We have adopted a European mentality, something that works functionally well for them, very well for them. And we brought up our children, and we're still bringing up our children in a way that, what was the, the, the quote from the Akotos? Islands that are self validating so you don't have any say. You don't have any control. In fact, you're old-fashioned. You're, you're, you're outdated. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not, you're not hip. You know, the, you, your, your, your logic is flawed. It's, it's ancient. When we allow them to change the nature of our child-rearing practices so that um, our children were allowed to do things that they weren't allowed to do before, we, we were not supposed to... Um, challenge them in terms of who their friends were. We were not supposed to regulate their television time. We were not supposed to deal with them, and even now, in terms of how much computer time that they're on, et cetera, et cetera. When you start doing that, and you have a child who, because there is no order and discipline in the home, and they have no reason to respect you in a capitalist system where money is the only way that you can get them to do what you want them to do, when you have a child who believes that they know everything. This is, this is not, not a bad, bad child. This is the nature of socialization in the West, the arrogance of ignorance. So you have children who think that they know everything already, so you can't instruct them. You can't tell them about who they are. You can't give them that kind of guidance because you allow that to go on for so long. Then this world, this sexually insane world, is going to socialize them. It's going to tell them what they're supposed to be about. In addition to, um, oh, there's so many points to this. Because when you have this extreme individualism, then you have people who believe that they know everything, that they validate themselves, but they don't realize that other people are guiding them. They are being socialized by um, someone, by some, I shouldn't say someone, a nation of people, whoever is in charge, is socializing them. If you can remove the parents' control from that, then they, becomes, they become completely socialized by this alien force, this alien culture, this alien society. Uh, when you have that situation, then 
the child is going to go the direction of that. And in fact, they're going to be motivated in multiple ways. One of the ways, um, which is, is very, um, it's getting stronger, is the um, peer pressure and the, um, if you will, generation gap. So uh, the, the, what happens within a generation gap? You have the idea that the people who came before you are backward. The people who came before you don't know what they're talking about. The people who came before you are wrong. You are right. Whatever direction you go, you're right. Whatever individual direction you go. And even though you're not going in some individual direction, the direction that you take still is going to conform to a certain set of parameters. I said this before when I was talking to the children about this and someone in a disagree said, okay, go, go to your school, go to your, your public or your private school, what have you, um, black person, black child, and dress as somebody from India or dress up as an indigenous person in this land or, or dressed up in goth or what have you. And people may, may point at you for a second or two if they do that, but you'll fit right in. But walk in there in full African attire and see how different the response is. So even though we're making these individualized choices, these are choices that fit within a certain framework. These are choices that fit within a white supremacist framework. Um, okay, so um, when, when you have the idea that old folks don't know and that you do, then your job really is to be the exact opposite of them. So if your parents and the older folks are heterosexual, then your, your job is to become homosexual. That's the aspiration. A lot of it is layered, too, because you might be being taught what's right, but you're not seeing that model. You're seeing mm -hmm. all the corruption, the hypocrisy, and the contradiction that those people are telling you don't do this, but they're saying this, but they're not modeling that. So then you're going to think they don't know what they're talking about. I'm not listening. Them. You are wrong. So then you really just wide open because you don't have the model showing you. You don't even just have them say, doing what they say and mean what they, you know, there's no balance to it. And that's, that's um, when we think about it, think about common sense or just, just think about what's logical. Um, adults aren't going to follow, intelligent adults, adults who have self-respect aren't going to follow someone who's contradictory. Right. So the children looking at you, and, of course, they're looking for a contradiction in you, mm -hmm. the nature of being a child, uh, particularly in Western society. But the nature of being a child, children want power. Why do they want power? So they can have their way all the time. That's, I eat what I want. If I want, you know, four plates of macaroni for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then I want the power to have four plates of macaroni for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If I want to drive your car, then I should be able to drive your car. That's the, that's the kind of power when you're talking about being a child. So the... Um, the, the, the goal is to be that kind of powerful person. The goal is to be that individual who uh, makes all the decisions for his or herself. And you can't um, give such an individual direction if you're a contradiction. And we are very contradictory. Very, very contradictory. Um, so that was, you know, absolutely on point. Because the, ch the children, the children observe um, of course, the, the part of that that has aided significantly in this is what I call spoiling, spoiling the children. If you spoil somebody, then you make them believe that they know everything, that they're always right. They never learn to struggle. And in this society, um, where work is seen as something that you don't want to have, where um, thinking is something that you really don't want to do uh, because it's associated with work, when you take someone and you spoil them, you weaken them. So whoever is in charge, whoever is, um, uh, is in control of what's being said, then they follow that because it would require too much thinking to argue with that. It would require too much intelligence to move along with that. So spoilers is a major, major um, issue here. Now, um, really I'll, that's all I want to talk about in terms of this raising of our children. I really want to talk about some solutions. Teach traditional African 
morality. Now, when we say traditional, we're talking about what fits you as a people in terms of your understanding of reality, your worldview. We're not talking about you have to go and physically live in the way that people live 10,000 years ago. Because tradition changes. Tra no, I shouldn't say tradition changes. Tradition modifies itself to fit the social environment that it's in, the technological environment that it's in. But some things don't change. Some things don't change. The heart of it doesn't change. The moral standing doesn't change. The, the, the uh, priority of certain virtues does not change. So over time, even though we moved from different types of situations dealing with Europeans, our family centeredness hasn't changed. Our child centeredness hasn't changed. The value that goes with that has not changed. And even though those are values and not necessarily morals, morals, values come out of morals. So these things don't change. So we have to teach those things to our children that apply to us. Of course, we have to have them understand that within the context of being African, within an African community, as a, you have to act differently outside of that because people will take you for a fool. That's, that's also part of the lesson. If you were a nation, you wouldn't have to teach that because everybody would essentially understand and be the same. But in this particular context, we don't have that advantage. So, so we have to say, well, here you say, here you can be African. Over there, you need to put your guard up. Over there, you need to have your shield up. So when we're talking about traditional African morality, we're talking about the respect for elders. We're talking about a love and appreciation of spirit. We're talking about an appreciation of, of rhythm. We're talking about an appreciation of learning, of education, deep appreciation, not just for a job, but your curiosity is supposed to be focused on learning something to improve yourself so that you can assist the community. You're talking about a priority on assisting people, especially those who have less than you do. These are African priorities. This is part of our tradition. And that doesn't change based upon um, whether you're an oppressed people or you're a sovereign people or you're living in the desert or you're living in the a forest land or what have you, that doesn't change. Those things remain constant. That's what we have to teach our children, those basic fundamental values. Complementarity, man and woman, those are basic fundamental African values. Those are part of our tradition, and that has to be taught to our children so they will understand who they are as part of a people. Otherwise, you, you, you can't make arguments based upon other people's logic. They have to understand who they are, and then when silliness comes at them like sexual insanity, they know that something is wrong. They automatically know um, that, that something is wrong. Of course, we have to study. Because most of us were brought up in this insanity, and most of us do not know. Most of us don't have the slightest idea what African morality is, African ethics. So, and there are many other books, but there are, in addition to the teachings of Batahotep, which I don't have here, and the teachings of so they have a comparative base or a base to contrast with. So um, in terms of African morality, the teachings of Batahotep, 
Um, a lot of karengas, the husia, is a very good discussion of our traditions. Let me pass these around. Shakunyuri Kamali's Person, Divinity and Nature is a very, very good book. Um, he's in the UK. Um, on the Tetla Sankofa, African Centered Education, excuse me, African Thought Education, which focuses on education, but there's so much in there about our sense of morality that's not funny. Um, Moshe's uh, The Heartbeat of Indigenous Africa, and even though there's a little confusion on his part there, he's, he's still very clear, and um, I don't even know if I want, because this one can be a little bit difficult for folks to read, but I'll pass it around. Anyway, I think that it needs to be read. But we have to study. We have to study. We can't talk to our children about African morality if we don't know Africa. We can't talk to our children about any African anything unless we have, we have studied, unless we understand um, what's going on. And books like the Teaching of Batalhotep and the Husia can be read with the children. The children can read that just as easy. And they will get a very good understanding. And this is the, both of those are the words of our ancestors, not you know our words. These are the words of our ancestors. So we have to study too. Um, another solution involves removal of the alien from African spaces. Because the alien is a carrier of his people or her people's mind. No matter what they do, no matter how hard they may try, it's going to come through. You are what you are. Okay? Um, this brings to mind a story. I believe it was Hakeem Adabuli. Well, the story was an analogy. He was talking about um, rats. And uh, he wrote this during the 60s, 70s, when um, rats and roaches were a big problem in our community, particularly the slum ghettos. Um, the time when, when um, Lead paint was a big problem because a lot of children were pulling it and there was poison in them. Uh, roaches, of course, were everywhere. And the rats were a problem not only because of the disease that they brought, but because they would eat flesh. So you had babies that were being attacked by rats, who were being bitten on, eaten on by um, rats. And the analogy went, if you came into your, your baby's room and you saw a rat you know, gnawing on your, your baby's leg, what do you do? Do you uh, try to negotiate with the rat? Do you go to the kitchen and get you some cheese and try to charm the rat away from your child? Do you um, get the child, put the child in some kind of child care and go to rat school so you can learn rat language, so you can communicate with the rat better? Or do you uh, corner the rat, take a baseball bat, and beat the rat to a pulp? Most of us pick A, B, and C. Most of us are not going to challenge somebody who's not supposed to be in our child's space. And in fact, many of us push that. So you have people who know that the choir director is flaming, but they will still allow their child to be there. They say, oh, well, because he can teach him how to sing better. Or same thing with the teacher. Oh, well, because he's got these skills and he needs to be around him. It doesn't make them, I'm just trying to create a good person. I'm not trying to create a man. I'm just trying to create a good person. You have all of these excuses um, that allow aliens to be in, in um, children's space. Another solution. Idiot box. Turn it off. Turn it off. I have never been able to watch, as a conscious person, I have never been able to watch television for... 10 minutes without seeing something that reflected European insanity. Never. And this is very important on impressionable eye, on impressionable minds. Seeds of planets. They know this one exposure will last a lifetime. Everything that goes into your head remains in your head. Everything that go, you know, everything that you see, you always can see everything that you hear is going to remain in there. It's a matter of recall or what have you, but still everything is going to be seen, everything is heard. And if we know that this is bad, which I hear people talk about this thing all the time. All the time. 
And the next, next post I'll see is something about a television show they're watching. So it's, it's sort of like the, say the, the drunken baby, the drunken fetus, where the mother drinks and the, the fetus gets drunk at the same time, and then the fetus wakes up with a hangover. So the, even though the alcohol affects the mother, it doesn't affect it to the degree that it does the baby. Because the baby is in a formative biological stage at that point. So we're watching TV and it's bothering us or it's infect, affecting us in a particular way. Imagine the degree to which it's affecting the child. And African folks in this country average over 70 hours of television a week. That's like, what, math, 10 hours a day? We watch that much a week. So you can imagine what's going into our minds. And we're not sitting there. Got to turn off the computer or control computer access. That was a beautiful commercial that was on recently. Ah, you all see that I double dabble with the TV, right? <laughs> when I'm eating, absolutely. Because you can't do anything while you're eating. You can't like play chess while you're eating. You can't, mm -hmm. so you got to have something on there. So I watched the old folks channel. Um, and there was a commercial on where this boy was in his room supposedly doing some research about a volcano on his computer. And his mother came to the door and checked to make sure that, that was what he was doing. And he said, yes, you know, and she left and she comes back an hour or so or later. And as soon as she walks in the door, he's got the computer so he hits that button and the research thing comes back on. For that whole hour, you know, what is, what is he watching? If he's an American child, if he has that curiosity, then he's somewhere he doesn't need to be, or somewhere he shouldn't be. And I said before, if you go to um, just, just, just Yahoo, and you have Yahoo Mail, and your junk mail, uh, you got all kinds of stuff in the junk mail. All you got to do is click on, all you got to do is, is go to Google and type in sex. And everything that you could possibly imagine will come up, or any other word that the child might have come across in one of these ads to find out what it is, because that's what Google's supposed to be for. It's supposed to get you answers, it's supposed to give you definitions, right? So instead of asking mom and dad who are so old that the definitions they give would be so outdated and plus they're extremely boring and long winded, I just go to Google and the problem is solved. Okay? So they are being infected by these. This is this is not an accidental. The most, um, of course, my computer um, language is outdated. The most clicked on, the most gone to sites are child pornography. Mm. The second most gone, to, most sites, most uh, uh, most visited sites are uh, bestiality. Yeah, because this is what's new. This is the latest, and that's what this culture teaches them in terms of progress. Anything that's new, anything that's different, that's considered to be progress. So you're old. You're you're like old school. <laughs> so if you if you if you want to stay on the cutting edge with the language, with the sexual behavior, with the food, whatever it is, then you have to be, you know, always on the cutting edge of this. So if somebody says bestiality, or that's something that people haven't seen, and everybody is is whatever it is they, they when they rush to it then that's what's going to be, you know, seen. That's what they're going to be attracted to. Um, and these things are addictions. They're very easily addicted. Uh, there's a reason why pornography is so popular, even among people who may want to get away from it. It's because it's so addictive. It, it, it like, takes over your, your priorities. It doesn't involve um, thinking. So we have to monitor the media closely. And then another one, which folks definitely aren't going to like, monitor friends. And that includes associates using common sense. Why is your child going to your teacher's house after school? Why is your child going anywhere near your teacher's house after school? Why is your child always in such and such a person's house when they're not home, but mom is there or dad is there? So we have to monitor the child's associates, friends. And I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. Of course, children do because children want power. 
And in this society, of being extremely individualistic, you're not supposed to have any say whatsoever. Or who they talk to, what have you. But our ancestors understood that parents are pretty smart. And they're smart because they have some experience. So they've been around people and been able to a significant degree generalize as to what kind of person that is, and what kind of person that is, and what kind of person that is, and whether they want that person to be around their child because of what they're trying to mold their child into, the kind of adult they want their child to be. So to me, good parents, just like when I was a child, good parents will tell you, yes, you need to be, watch her, see what she's doing, go, you know, go play with her, because I know who her parents are, I know her character, I've, you know, I've seen her in class, I'm like, yeah, you could... But but him, <laughs> don't go there, you know. And we did that not only because we had a healthy fear of our parents, which I think is also good, um, but because we knew that our parents loved us, and they wouldn't, they didn't spend their night trying to figure out how to make our life miserable. They were looking out for our best interest, and even though we might not have agreed with it. I might I want to hang out with him. But I knew better because of that healthy fear and because I assumed that as my parents, as the adults, that they knew more than I did. But the spoilage factor makes children think that they know more than the adults do. So the goal comes, for the child comes to be, since the parent has the wallet, the goal comes to be, how do I manipulate the money out of the parent? That becomes the life's goal. That becomes the life's goal. We see, we see too much of that, absolutely too much of that. From this, we'd have to say, uh, do not place your child under I don't know. These, these just sound like common sense. Carter G. Wilson and Malcolm both said it quite well about um, the kind of people who allow the enemy to educate or to care for their children. This makes absolutely no sense to, to, to thinking for people. Of course, we have people now who will leave their children to care for themselves at home. And he always talks about the two sisters in, in her hometown who uh, left their children, I believe it was seven of them, uh, in the house to go to a club. House caught on fire, burn all the children up. But in a way, even though I know that's wrong, I can't get upset with them. I have to get upset with the society, with the process of socialization, with the values that have been instilled in them, that would make them do that logically. And to see this as something that they should do. These weren't bad people. And this is where the logic of our ancestors, the traditional logic of our ancestors come in because our ancestors said you don't blame the person, you, you, you get upset at the, the act itself. So you have to analyze why that act came up. And the ancestors also understood that if somebody's got an issue, somebody's got a problem in your community, in your village, what have you, then you look at the village. Okay, so if this person's got some kind of psychological issue that's going on, then you don't sit that person on the couch. You sit everybody on the couch. How could this have happened in this space? You don't just look at that person and point finger who bad, bad person. You look at the entire village, the entire community to see what's wrong. That would allow this person to do that, would lead this person to do that, would make this person think that this makes sense, that this, this is not care. And of course, most folks, when they say enemies, they're going to immediately think Urugu. But to me, that's also Negroes with a lower end, lost souls. And within this category, if you will, particularly what we're talking about, homosexualized Africans. Of course, it's problematic in this reality because so many of us have been infected that so many people see anybody who is vulnerable or less powerful than them as prey. So that can be very difficult to do. 
but you're supposed to take every precaution possible. That's what good parents do. They take precautions. Good parents act. They don't react. They understand what's going on in society. They understand um, how people are socialized. They understand the insanity here, so they don't take chances. If they heard a rumor about this guy over here, then they're not going to send their child to that person until they have thoroughly checked out that rumor. You're going to make sure that your children are, you're going to act. Reaction means that when well, you send your child and then you find out something horrible happened and then you want to take this person to go, it's too late then, the child mind is tore up. Okay, so good parents act, they don't react. So we automatically, automatically know you don't send your child to a European, period. That's just understood. That's automatically understood. I don't care if that person will be a good person, bad person, indifferent. That's automatic. We know we're at war. And you automatically don't send your child to a Negro. I don't care if it's in your family. This is too many mistakes, and all it takes is one second. All it takes is one conversation with that individual, and that logic stays in that child's mind and quietly fights against you until they're old enough to leave you. Because that's another thing about children, particularly children who... Uh, are raised in conscious families who don't really want a, that kind of discipline in their lives. They're smart enough to know how to act the way the parents want them to act while they're concealing what they're thinking. So, so that's growing, but the deceit also is growing because they're learning how to manipulate so they're not found out for what they really are or what they're really, really about. And you don't find out until they leave home. And then you go into shock. Why did you eat that? What are you wearing that? You did what to your hair? It's been there. And often, that's a result of conversations with people that shouldn't have been around. Whether it's peers or family members or what have you. You have to be very, very careful. Very, very straightforward. Um, two of our friends, who younger friends who, who recently, relatively recently got married, at their wedding ceremony, they explained to the folks who were there, because most of their family did not understand, did not want to understand, and were still doing everything in their power to um, bring their son along the Negro way. And they explained at this thing, you know, we trying to be nice about this, but we don't want you bringing, you know, white dolls, we don't want you doing this, we don't want you doing that. And those, those things have to be explained, so you at least have um, some rules laid down. And then when people disrespect your space, you've already made the point, and then you can stop that, and you can keep that person away from it. I don't have anything, I don't have a problem with well with family members. I love my family. But you're not going to disrespect me being African. Period. That's, that's the end of the discussion right there. Because I'm not going to disrespect you being a Negro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, also, well, at least not to your face. <laughs> also, two most important things that come out of this, well, I'll say three. And it sort of sounds like I'm talking about things that we need to do in general in our community, in general as families, whether we're talking about sexual insanity or not. But if you're doing the thing, doing these things correctly in general, then they'll understand that that's wrong. And they won't be able to run into a situation or be involved in something that where sexual insanity can occur. They will not be in that position. Okay. Um, develop strong, long. I'd even go so far as to say annual. Lasting for a year, nine months. Rice of passage programs. Separate one for boys, then for girls. And if any freak comes along and says, oh well, I know enough about my masculine side and feminine side to have both a boys and girls rice of passage program, run. Run. Children in total, run. That individual is lost. That individual is sexually insane, whether it's visible or not. And we should know by now that deceit 
is one of the main um, ways by which sexual insanity has been infused into our community. Deceit is like the most important thing. The deception is, is um, beyond words. We're talking about developing our children along lines of traditional African morality, and understanding of who they are. We're not talking about a program where you go for a month, month and a half, two months, you learn how to sing Kumbaya together, you get a little red, red, black and green scarf, you get a new name and you learn how to hit a drum a few times and you've learned your lineage back one or two generations. We're talking about you developing an understanding of your traditions. Developing an understanding of, in the case of boys, what it means to be a man. In the case of girls, what it means to be a woman. Uh, developing uh, a clear understanding of your responsibility, of your power, and your responsibility of that power to the community. Uh, an understanding of what spirit is about, of what divinity is about, the divinity within. An understanding of who you are. That takes some time. That takes some reading, that takes some study, that takes some conversation, that takes a lot of videos, that takes a lot of lectures by elders in the community. That takes a lot of nights out in the woods where you sit there and you have conversation where people get comfortable because mom and dad ain't nowhere to be seen and these are the fellas, or these are the sisters, what have you. And that takes some time. You can't do that in two, three, four, five months. So you're talking about a rice and passage program that's going to be nine months, 12 months. And when this group of boys goes to its next level, to the next year, where they're going to have a new rites of passage program for them, then they're also going to be responsible for helping to educate the boys who are in the year behind them. So in that way, they develop an understand, a deeper understanding of what community means, what responsibility means. It's always um, phenomenal. It always brings a smile to my face whenever I see boys given responsibilities that are a little bit bigger than them, whether security or something like this, and they, they, they do 20 times what they could be doing just to prove to themselves, not to the people who are watching, whatever, but to prove to themselves just how good they are. So in order for you to teach something, then you have to know it. You can't just, you know. So for them to be able to have that responsibility is a major statement for them. In these rites of passage programs, and one of the most damaging things that I have seen over the years in rites of passage programs is when you have uh, a numbers priority, and of course there are other ways, but a numbers priority, where you're more concerned about the success based upon the number who went through versus the quality of the minds that come through. It's very important in that respect to know the minds of the parents. Because the people who are doing the rites of passage program, their minds should be in line with the, with the uh, minds of the parents, whose sons and daughters they are bringing through this program. I have seen too many times, too many um, um, hurt, um, disgusted, uh, battered rites of passage leaders, um, so disappointed because of what they saw the boys and or girls do when they left the program because they were never there from the get and when you looked at the parents you could understand why because the parents weren't there put the boy in the rice and pass program because this will teach them a little bit about manhood and I really didn't have anything to do with him over the summer anyway so here you take them no this is something serious when you're talking about developing boys and girls for the front line this is very serious very, very seriously. You can't, this, this is not about play, and you have to have parents in line with that. So it's sort of like school. You say the school is supposed to be extension of the home, or what the school teaches is supposed to be a reflection of what is taught in the home. The same thing should apply with the Rites of Passage program. What's going on in the Rites of Passage program? For you? And if it's too African for you, you don't need to have your child in there. If there's too much discipline in there, you need to not have your child in there. If it's too heterosexual for you, you need to not have your child in there. Because in Rites of Passage programs, we're supposed to be talking to our children about issues that are in their face. We're supposed to be talking to our children about the homosexualization of African people. We're supposed to be talking to our children about interracial coupling. We're supposed to be talking to our children about war. We're supposed to be doing this. And you're supposed to have done this with your child also before he or she came to us. So we, sh we shouldn't start talking about 
the homosexualization of African children, African people, and somebody raises their hand and says, what's wrong with homosexuality? We shouldn't have that. That shouldn't be occurring. Okay, so we're, we're trying to train our children to man the front line. We're trying to train a particular brand, a particular group of people. Not everybody, because everybody is not able. Everybody is not capable, because they're too deeply involved in their mental side. So we have to be very selective, or you're going to end up throwing all of your energy and time away. Throwing it away on people who do not know and do not want to know. And it's, that's like I see people trying to argue with people, trying to convince them to be African. You can't convince anybody to be African. And if they did agree with what you said, more than likely it was because you're just a good person in argumentation and they lost the argument. Mm -hmm. Other, otherwise, you didn't do anything. Okay. Bill. is, of course, intimately connected to that. We have to build our schools. And I'm not necessarily talking about full-fledged formal institutions where you have this big building and, you know, you have enrollment of 30, 40, and all that stuff. I'm talking about any way that we do this. If it's an after-school program, if it's one, two, three hours on a weekend, if it's uh, 8.30 to, to, to 6, what have you, in your home. We're talking about building schools so that our children can learn the things that they need to learn in an uncompromised fashion. I hear so many folks talking about um, how the public school, school system is doing their children wrong and they're still sending their children to these schools. And in many cases, they're not sending their children to these schools prepared to do battle. It's, it's different. Sometimes you do not have a choice, but you still do the best that you can. You still infuse into your child the best you can. And you tell your child, okay, this is between you and I. Understand the insanity that you may have to deal with out there, but we have to understand this, and you need to, need to know enough so that you can prevent certain things from coming in your direction. You know when to leave the conversation. You know when to leave because you know this is getting ready to go on. This is getting ready to happen. You need to be in another place. But we have to build those institutions where our children understand who they are. They understand our story. They understand this connectedness to math. They understand all of these things about us. We have to be responsible. That's hard work. That's very, very hard work. And if we can't build these schools because of whatever factor, uh, then we need to support those institutions that do. And not just financially. Our children need to be there at these institutions that have the same mindset as we do that think like us as an extension of our home. So we don't, we don't have to have 40 million different schools. We don't have 40 million different uh, after school programs. And if it got to that number, I'm beginning to wonder what's happening anyway at this point in time because all of them are not going to be African centered. Most of them are just going to be quote unquote black. So those that really pursue the interest of African centeredness, not just consciousness, which is becoming a, a misnomer for so many things, that pursue African-centeredness, then those schools need to be where we're at. Like in the old days, where a parent would come and volunteer an hour a week because that's what they could give. And when you had 30 parents, then you had virtually somebody there you know, all the time doing this. Or um, a parent worked in a business someplace, so once a month they bring in a ream of paper. Well, parents will volunteer to, to, to be the, the, the escorts, chaperones for this, or, or you know, these that's what it's about. That's community involvement. That's making it happen. You being there. No teacher ever tried to mess with my head in elementary school because my mother was always there. You guys know my last nerve, but my mother was <laughs> always there. She was, this teacher needed to go to the bathroom. My mother was sitting in the class watching the children while she went to the bathroom. Somebody needed something tight, she would be in there doing it. And she's still got two jobs, but she's doing that, making sure, because she knows that her presence there. And I remember one teacher even tried, Miss Martian. We called her, like, from Mars, Miss Martian. This white lady, white lady, white female. 
And um, I tell the students about it, because she was like double jointed, and she'd sit on your desk, and, and she, the spittle was always coming out of one side of her mouth. And I was like, for you can imagine, the fifth graders, oh my gosh. So um, one day, and I don't even remember what I did, but I, I know that I did whatever it was, I did do it. Um, she didn't let me go home for lunch. And our house was right across the street from the school. So about 20 minutes after 12, I hear these footsteps come down the hallway. <laughs> and my mother comes in the door, and she looks at her, and she said, why is, you know, why is he still here? He's going to come home for lunch. And before she started to explain, my mother looked at me, and she said, go home. <laughs> I went home. I didn't have another problem. <laughs> I don't know what went on. I don't know what was said. I didn't see any marks, so I assume. But that was, you know, and when you have that type of situation where everybody's so close, Develop conscious. I'm really not liking this word. Center community. Most people, what immediately comes to mind, especially folks who were doing this 20 years ago or 15 years ago, they think about it in terms of people pooling their money, like the Susu and all the rest of that. That's not what I'm talking here. I'm talking about because we're talking about the centered part of the community. We're talking about a group of people who understand that homosexuality is an issue, that sexual insanity is an issue, it shouldn't be part of our life or in our space. That interracial coupling is not something that should be part of our space, cannot be part of the, of the movement. So these individuals in the center are in agreement on that. White folks should not be coming to drum and dance. These individuals understand that. This is not, I'm not talking about the conscious community because you get a lot of folks who call themselves conscious who have no issues with that. In fact, promote all of that themselves. So we're talking about those individuals, which may be a small number of families. Maybe out of uh, 30 families, there might be three who get it. Those individuals need to form their own communities. That doesn't mean that they isolate themselves from everybody else and can't speak to anybody else and, and better than anybody else or, or move. No. And in fact, really, if, you, if you're the center, then these other folks serve as a buffer from other insanities. Okay? You use them in a way. Okay? But here, these three families, they share space. They teach each other's children. They have, they have their own garden. They do virtually everything together because this allows their children to interact so that the child doesn't grow up saying, oh, well, I really don't want to be African-centered because it was a miserable childhood because nobody was there but me and I never had anybody to play with. And oh, well, now I'm really trying to find out what the world is about. So boom. No. So they have, you have the safe, sacred space where people can learn and play and truly be African in that space. And where all of those other things, all those insanities can't get in there. And everybody's on the same page, everybody understands. This is some conversations. And you can uh, it, you lay down a set of rules. For, for us in our center, no Euros, no Negroes, no homos, no promos. Great, that's baseline. And if you have an issue or uh, you've got to be awfully deceitful, if you can get past, you know, if, if this is an issue for you, then, then you don't need to be in this space. And we've removed a lot of people from this space because of that. A lot of people. I don't have a problem with there being three of us or five of us or seven of us. I'd rather die right. So it's very important to develop these collectives for support, you can call it a support group if you want to. I don't care. You call it a support group of center people. It can be very difficult for people who are centered, who live in a place where they are very the, the conscious community is very small, and they may be the only family. And I, I feel for them, but they still need to 
isolate themselves in a way so that their children are not exposed. Because, I, I mean, it's t t to me, when I look at a lot of people who say they're going to be conscious, I don't see the difference between them and Negroes. I don't see the difference between them and, and Europeans. Except maybe they wear some African attire or they attend quote unquote African events or the festivals or, or you know, eat live or, or vegan, which is now supposed to be a conscious thing. You got folks who are completely, totally unconscious who are vegan and, and, and live. But it's all for quote unquote conscious folks, many of the conscious folks, it's just superficial stuff. It's like the, the idea of um, sacrifice in um, our tradition. There, there is the sacrifice where you, you know, you, you sacrifice something, and there's a sacrifice that you sacrifice of yourself. Um, and the, 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 our books say, this is good, this is necessary, but without a good moral base, without a good moral person, this is irrelevant. This holds no meaning. So all of the blood cloth and kente cloth and cowrie shells and all the rest of it don't mean anything unless you're doing the work, unless you have the heart, unless you understand the concept of enemy, unless you realize that we're at war, unless you realize, understand, and act against the homosexualization of African people. And not just mumble it under your breath, but make sure. I mean, you have to have conversation, but make sure your children are clear. Make sure that the people your children associate with are clear. Make sure the people who your children play with are clear. Make sure who you sit down and have meals with, who you garden with, is clear. Do I really want that energy on my food? Man, we, all these folks are into the energy and the crystal, all the rest of this stuff, and yet when it comes to that, that's, you know, that, no, this is energy. Everything is energy. So that kind of energy shouldn't be around what we eat, what we wear, what we buy who sits in our vehicle with us, that kind of energy shouldn't be there. These should be choices. One, one strategy that I found that's been really helpful in putting seeds at that community connect is in kids, because it's like 5 to 11, is really transforming their thinking from that competitive nature to cooperation. They have to do everything together. If you don't all work it out, nobody gets anything. Just really making them grow in those type of situations because that's that's that extreme individualism is so hard to break. Especially if you have a large family and you gotta be isolated and you wanna do that, it's best to just get as many cooperation building skills that you can do with the family, everybody. Friends, you know, mm -hmm. so you get out of that competitive mindset. Mm -hmm. I think that um, gardening is probably the best avenue to that for a lot of people. I've seen children who would, you know, battle, and then you put them in a garden, and they can work, you know, they can, they can work together. Of course, the, the, the garden is also very revealed about character, because you, you see the difference between people who work hard and the lazy ones. Well, I, <laughs> I always tell them, they start to complain, like, your ancestors didn't get a break. Mm -hmm. This was sun up to sun down, they didn't have mm -hmm. a choice. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't bring your complaints about these few hours. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you think about what they had to go through. So they shut up real quick then, you know. So. I would have been a slave. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that so many times. Bro. Yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 That takes time to develop. It is because I say I trust you. It's got to be demonstrated repeatedly until it gets to a point where, okay, yeah, I don't even think about it anymore. I don't think about lack of trust, whatever. And to start out, folks young on this. Oh, and that's, that's another point which um, um, I think we talked about it before. But, no, we had talked about it before, but I think it needs to be really those people who you, um, those children who you want to match up with your children. You need to know them from children. Because there's a lot of deceit going on in the air. A lot of surgeries. A lot of fake this. A lot of fake that. You don't know who your child is marrying. You don't know who your child is going to be with. And that's another advantage of this space. Since marriage is very important to African people. Very, very important to African people. It's the foundation of the family, children, all the rest of this. Since marriage is so important, then when your children, before your children are born, really, then you need to be looking for someone for that, some 
ones that that person and your child can choose from. That will make a good compliment for that child. And you want, I imagine, I know I do, I want the person with the best possible character for my child. And the only way to really tell a person's character is if you've seen them for a long time. Because people will lie. People deceive. Somebody tried to start up a um, online uh, dating service for conscious people a number of years ago. And it fell through the floor. Why? Because everybody was lying. <laughs> everybody was lying. And the, the sad part for them was that they then said, okay, well, let's, let's go to the elders in the community and, uh, and talk to them later, the different elders and olders. And so they said, let's go to the elders in the community and then have them tell us about the character of these individuals so we'll know who, and, and you know, set them up. And then the elders, or the olders, the elders were clear. Some of the olders, they were, you know, what, whatever, yeah. you know. So you have to, you have to be in someone's, someone's space. You have to be in the, the, the children's space who you want for your children. I don't think that's selfish. I don't think that that's, that's not child marriage. Because your child is still going to make the choice. We get lost in this, this, this really stupid Eurocentric logic that the children uh, didn't have a choice who they were going to marry. Yes, she had every right to say, no, I don't want him. In the discussion. He had every right to say, no. Well, he was usually the one who was after. But he had every right to say, no, I don't want him. So that wasn't the case. You you want to make sure that there is a pool there available for your child. That's what you want, so that your child can find someone to work with, so your child can find someone to have as a compliment, somebody to love. So um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to stop because I'm through. <laughs>